thankful for its truth. Lord, we thank you for uh, the truth that comes to us even if we don't want to hear it, especially, Lord, when we don't want to hear it, when it points out our sin and shows us our need of a Savior. But God, we also thank and praise you that your word shows us what you have done in order to provide a Savior for us. Thank you, God, that you do not give up on us, uh, but you continue to pursue us with your relentless love. Lord, I pray that that would be made evident today as we study your word. Be with all those who aren't able to be here this morning, that you'd be drawing them closer to yourself, and God, that they would be learning more about who you are and your love for them too. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we get started here, uh, I know I took a week off last week. We didn't go through this timeline, and maybe we didn't two weeks ago too. I'm not sure, but I'll test your, test your memory here. 2100 B.C., what uh, big event in Scripture happens at this time? Or what's the, what time frame are we looking at in scriptural events? Who is a contemporary at this time? There, maybe I'll ask this question. I know it's all before your time. Abraham. Abraham. So this is, when you're reading about Abraham, uh, he lived a long time, so 2100 around there. But 2100 is when Abram is called to get up, leave your country, and come follow me. Go to the place where I will show you, I will bless you, I will curse those who curse you, bless those who bless you, I will make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The promise is given around that time there. Uh, moving on to the next big event in Scripture, and that's not to say everything in between is not important, uh, but just timeline stuff. 1446 B.C., what event happens then? The Exodus. And what was the Exodus? When the Israelites left Egypt to go to the Promised Land, God calls them to be his people. He says, I will be your God. You will be my people. Uh, and he says, let's go. And so they go. Uh, that's a, a brief summary here. They say, let's go. Uh, God takes them out of Egypt, and then they wander around for how many years? 40 years. Why do they wander around for 40 years? Because of their sin and their unbelief. Um, because they wanted to go, and they, you remember... Uh, Twelve men went to spy on Cain, and ten were bad, and two were good. You know that little nursery rhyme kind of a thing, the story from Scripture, from Numbers? They go to spy out the promised land, and uh, they come back, bringing back these huge grapes, and say, this land is great, it's fantastic, we can't wait to get there. But ten people were saying, but they are like giants over there. We don't stand a chance. And there were two who said, but God has given us this land, let's go. But majority wins, so they stay, and they wander for another 40 years. And then finally, 1406, they enter into the Promised Land, and the conquest happens under Joshua. 1050 B.C., uh, or in between that time, is a period of Judges. So you read the book of Judges. There isn't a king in the land, but there is a, a judge, a governor, who is kind of ruling, who is delivering them. There's a circle or a cycle of sin. God's people find themselves in sin. They find themselves in oppression and judgment for their sin. They cry out, God help us. God brings up a judge. The judge delivers them. Everything's good for a little while. Then they get themselves into sin. They find themselves in oppression because of their sin. They cry out to God, God help us. God sends a judge, raises up a judge to deliver them, delivers them, and the cycle keeps on going. Finally, at some point in that cycle, they say, you know what? We want to be a kingdom just like everybody else. We want a king, a man with flesh and bones who we can follow into battle, who we can say, here is our king, this is our guy, we are going to follow him. He is our man. And so 1050, God says, fine, have it your way. Saul is anointed a king. This is the king that you are asking for. That lasts for 40 years, and then David's anointed king. He reigns for 40 years. Solomon's anointed king. He reigns for 40 years. The kingdom is divided after the end of Solomon's reign. The northern kingdom is called what? Israel, Ephraim, Ephraim, yeah, northern kingdom, all of these things, Samaria, all of these are words to describe the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom is called Judah. And after the northern kingdom's gone, it's also called Israel too, just to make sure that everyone's getting confused with all that. Uh, but so the kingdom is uh, divided. In 966, Solomon completes the temple, and this is a great revival time of God's people here. And it's an exciting time. Uh, they're following the Lord. Things are going well. 
In 722, Samaria is destroyed, or the northern kingdom is destroyed. And we're not there yet, but we are getting there. Uh, Hosea is around this time uh, that the book of Hosea is written, 740 to 715, somewhere around there. So that's the time frame where we're looking at right now, and we will see what God's word has to say to people living in that day and that context. Uh, We're looking at Hosea chapter 7. Bless you. Hosea chapter 7. And I will start with, uh, with reading verse 8 because we kind of stopped in between a section here. Uh, Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. Ephraim has become a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength. Yet he does not know it. Gray hairs also are sprinkled on him. Yet he does not know it. Though the pride of Israel testifies against him, yet they have not returned to the Lord their God, nor have they sought him for all this. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. When they go, I will spread my net over them. I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. So here we are, uh, we left at verses, left off at verses 12 through 13 here, but we see uh, Ephraim is looking just like everybody else, and were they supposed to blend in with everyone else? Why not? Mm-hmm. Looking like everybody else means worshiping everyone else's gods, and God has been very clear from the beginning, saying, you shall have no other gods before me, or after me, for that matter, too. I am the Lord your God. I am one. There is one God, and I am he. And so here they're looking just like everyone else. They're worshiping all these other gods. They're supposed to be set apart, and in their uh, set-apartness, if I can use that terminology, in their set-apartness, they were to draw all men to God, realizing The God in Israel is different. Things happen differently with these people than with any other people in the world. And God was using them to call other people to himself. That was the game plan. That was the intent behind it. But they failed. Uh, They failed in their task with that. And they looked just like everybody else. Their problem is exposed. They're prideful. They have abandoned God. Uh, They're relying on their strengths and finding out that they really have no strengths. And so God says to them in verse 12, When they go, I will spread my net over them. I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. My question for you is who is going to bring them down? God. How is God going to bring them down? But you're not going to find this answer in in verse 12 here. Through wars. Through Through fighting. fighting. God is going to be using other nations to bring them down. He could have just sent bolts of lightning. He could have sent large hailstones. He could have just destroyed the whole thing like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. But God chooses a different route. He chooses to use a different nation, pagan people, who are not God-fearing by any stretch of the imagination, to come and... (laughs) whoop up on his people, his people who have turned their backs against him and will not acknowledge him, uh, the ones who look just like everybody else. And so it's kind of hard, harsh here saying, wait a second, God, why are you bringing destruction on these people? Aren't these people your people? Aren't these your chosen ones? Aren't these the ones that you are going to set apart for yourself? Aren't these the ones that you have to only be loving towards and you have to be kind to no matter what they do? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they're uh, decaying from inside. Through their own choice. Yeah, it's good to know that we never do any self-destructive decisions, right? Or any anything like that. But we look at our own lives and we realize we're the same. The people have been the same since beginning. Uh, different cultures, different families, different rituals, different all these different things, but at the end of the day, a person is a person, and the sinful nature that we all have, everybody has. Yeah. Yeah, and that doesn't and that doesn't mean you look at someone and say, okay, what color skin color do you have right now? And then, okay, we're going to be married. Uh, unequally yoked, it has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with who is God. Um, and that's what it is, believers and unbelievers. Paul's pretty clear about that. And that's what it was meant to be as well. Back in the Old Testament, that's why God said that. Not because, uh, not because people farther east were but worse off humans than the Israelites or different things like that. It had everything to do with who your God was. Yeah, you peel back the the news headlines, and you look a little bit deeper, and you realize God is still in charge. God is still directing, <laughs> directing history as we're seeing it being unfurled. Um, and it's, it's comforting to know that, because at times when you just look at headlines and you see what's going on, all of a sudden you think, ah, it's going to get really bad. And it may get really bad, but God is still sitting on the throne, and he always will be there. And there's comfort for us in that. And so we shouldn't tense up too much with that, but recognize when God is calling us to quit sinning, we should probably listen and uh, pay attention to what he's saying. And when I say probably, I'm being a little facetious. We should listen. Uh, verse 13, asking the question, why is God going to bring destruction on them? Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Why is God going to bring his punishment on these people? Why doesn't he just redeem them? Mm -hmm. They strayed, they rebelled, they've spoken lies against him. Um, that's, not, that's not the way a marriage relationship works. Is it? If someone, if you were to uh, stray from your spouse, that might be one thing. Your spouse might hunt you down and say, no, come back. Okay. If you were to stray from your spouse and rebel against your spouse and your spouse still hunts you down, well, that's gonna, you're going to have some marital counseling issues that need to be done. And if you rebel and lie about your spouse and all these different things, it's still going to be a toxic situation here. But these people have left the promise of God for other things. Uh, and we'll find that out as we keep on reading. I don't know what chapter it is, but it's, it's coming up, maybe the next chapter. Uh, but they've rebelled. They've left the covenant that God has made with them. And so God owes them nothing. And yet here in this chapter, we see God calling out to them yet again, saying, hey, when these things happen, recognize this isn't the Assyrians who are doing this. This is me behind all of these things. And this is why, because of what you have done, you have left me. Come back to me. I will redeem you. Verse 14, what are they looking for? And they do not cry to me from their heart, for when they wail on their beds, for, when they wail on their beds for the sake of grain and new wine, they assemble themselves. They turn away from me. All they care about is grain and new wine. 
turning away from God, if their wine and grain gets taken away, all of a sudden, okay, now God, give us our wine and grain back. This is all we want. When crops start getting a little dry, God, give us rain. I want my crops to thrive. When things are going bad within family situations and family, uh, when there are strained relationships within the family, God, bring this person back to home. Bring them back home. I want everything to be back together again. What is it that we are idolizing in these things? Now, we want what's best for our kids. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, we want to... We, Are we focusing on, on the Lord here? Or are we focusing on the good gifts of the Lord and elevating them and worshiping them? Worshiping, in the words of Paul, worshiping creation above the creator. Well, that's an important part of prayer, too, is to include the thanksgiving and uh, you know, the praise for the salvation, too, not just give me praise. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, saying, God, your will be done. These are the, this is my ask list, God. But I recognize I only see through the glass dimly right now. I don't see the whole picture. You see the whole picture. You know what's going on. Let your will be done. And letting God be God and accepting whatever it is that, uh, that comes our way, I guess, with that. And that's a hard thing. I'm not saying I do it perfectly by any stretch of the imagination. But it shows us what is most important to us in these things. It shows us what are we trusting in. Are we trusting in uh, the lack of tension at home to have a good family? Or are we trusting in the Lord and his care and his provision? Uh, one of them will let us down. One of them will not. Mm -hmm. We often put in actually turn out wanting things the way it's supposed to be wanted or to turn out. Yeah. I want what I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a passage uh, in Romans talking about um, talking about God and his goodness and saying something along the lines of how will how will he who, not only, who didn't spare his only son, not freely give us all things and all good things. And we take that and we say, well, here's a good thing that I want, a new car, a new truck, uh, a peach tree that's flourishing with peaches and all of these good things. Hasn't happened yet, but God, these are all the good things that you said you're going to give to me here. But we take a step back and we realize what is a good thing? Who gets to define what a good thing is? And what are the things that God's going to give? It's not my wish list. It's God's. And so we accept gratefully with thanksgiving whatever it is that God gives to us, recognizing his goodness. And every good and perfect gift comes from him, uh, comes from God himself. And that, that change comes from exactly looking in God's word and seeing who God is and how God has acted in the past and realizing what it is that God is accomplishing. If you were to take this passage of scripture and isolate it from every other passage of scripture, you'd think, well, I guess I'll ask this question. What would you, how, how would you describe God if this is all you had to base your knowledge of God off of? Well, yeah. Disciplining, mean, not a nice guy, all of these different things. But we haven't just been given Hosea 7. We've been given everything from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. And we look at who God is and everything that God has done. Then we see this passage in the greater picture 
in the greater context of who God is and what God is accomplishing, and all of a sudden, that pill's a little easier to swallow because we recognize, God, I only see things from my perspective, and it's only this high. But you, from your viewpoint, you see everything that's going on. You know what you're doing. If you want to use the analogy of looking at a, I don't know, a weaving thing or something like that. You see the back as you work on it. You see all these ruffles and whatever else. It doesn't look all that great, but you turn it around, and all of a sudden, there's a masterpiece. Um, you can see the final picture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also another point along with that too, this is no, recognizing where we are and recognizing uh, there's a hole in this boat. If you want to use a boat analogy here, there's a hole in your boat because you think this is who God is. He's just a leaky faucet kind of a thing. You don't fix the boat when you're in the middle of the ocean. You spend time building that boat, fixing that boat, making sure it's good to go before it launches. So when it's tested, it stands up. Uh, same thing with our, with our faith. We study God's word. We learn who God is so that when the trials and whatever uh, trials come in our lives where we are tempted to say, based on this little picture, this little trial in my life right now, this is who God is, we can take a step back and realize, oh, that's just a portion of, of everything. But take a step back and see the bigger picture of who God is. Uh, prepare ahead of time for the trials. That, that come our way, because trials are definitely going to come. They're, they're promised to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's knowing who God is. Uh, stay tuned. In the sermon, we're going to touch a little bit on that. Sorry. Yeah, stealing, stealing my thunder. Uh, but no, this. It's fun to see how all this stuff is coming together here. Uh, Even if, and even if we never see the results of what God is doing, it's not about us. Um, God is allowed to write the story. He has permission to do that. Um, Yeah, we'll keep on going here. We will finish this chapter today. Uh, Verses 15 through 16. Well, end of verse 14. They turn away from me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They turn, but not upward. They are like a deceitful bow. The princes will fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue, and this will be their derision in the land of Egypt. Destruction is going to come to them at the hands of the one who delivered them from Egypt. A hard pill to swallow, but an understandable pill when you realize everything that Israel is doing. They have rejected God. They have rebelled against him. They are telling lies about him. He has called them to be his own, a holy people, a royal priesthood. 
to be drawing all people to himself, and they are failing miserably in that task. And so God is going to start over again here. Remove them from this situation, uh, and he is going to discipline them. Going into chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Uh, verse 1, put the trumpet to my lips. Why would someone put a trumpet to their lips? Are they going to start a symphony here? Yeah. This is before cell phones. This is before the, uh, the tornado sirens and all this other stuff. So here you go. You've got a trumpet to sound, make the... The, yeah, the sound to get everyone's attention. So God says, the trump, put the trumpet to your lips. Everybody pay attention. This is important. Listen to what I have to say. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Again, God is sending the warning and he is, <laughs> the people shouldn't be confused about why this is happening. God has said it over and over again. You've transgressed my law. You've rebelled against me. This is why this is happening. Verse 2, they cry out to me, My God, we of Israel know you. Uh, we'll pause here. Is this a true statement? Yeah. They might know God. might know about God. They're not trusting God. And if they were... Mm -hmm. Well, they know that they need a shepherd, but not everybody that's sitting in the church is true believers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. A, that's what kind of leads us into heart. Right? Faith is more than just knowledge of something. Faith is a trust in something. And they're saying here, hey, God, we know you. Uh, we know your name. We know where your temple is. We know all of these things about you. You shouldn't treat us this way, uh, is the gist of, of what they're saying. But God again says, yeah, you say you know me, but you've rejected me. You say you know me, but you've rebelled against me. You say you know me, and yet you're giving all the credit to my delivering you out of Egypt to this golden calf that you just built. You say you know me, and yet you're still setting up all these altars around to worship and asking Baal for rain and asking Baal for grain and wine and all of these things. And yet you say you know me. You've turned away from me. It's not about a knowledge game here. Uh, verse 3, Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. There's the... <laughs> The blunt statement, what's going to happen? Israel tries to claim special relationship privileges, saying, hey, we at least know about you, uh, and it works to no avail. Their hearts have not changed. Verses 4 through 6, God says, They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. He has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For now is for from Israel is even this. A craftsman made it, so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. The Lord has rejected their idols. What are their idols? In verse 4, the very first line there, what's the idol that they're holding to the beginning of verse 4? Their king, and how do they get their kings? Because this isn't the king I wanted, God. So what are you going to do about it? Form a coup, assassinate the king, put your own king on the throne, and that's what happened. That's what happened is happening during the time of Hosea. But as we just read from Romans thirteen, God is the one who is in charge. Good king, bad king, whatever. God is the one who is ultimately in. Control, and they're rejecting the king that God has placed there. And this isn't saying, uh, oh, what was that idea with in England that they said the king is God's own and you shouldn't touch them or by divine right or something like that. This isn't 
talking about that here. Um, but God has put his own king on the throne here. And they're saying, nope, out with this guy. We want a different guy who is no better than the one before. He reigns for a little bit, and then they decide he's still no better than the one before. We're going to get someone else. So we see one of their idols here uh, is in their politics and who they have sitting as king. And that's where they place their comfort in. That's where they place their identity in. That's where they place their security in. As long as we got our guy sitting on the throne, then everything's going to be just fine for us. We'll bring it a little closer to home. As long as we've got our guy sitting in the White House, everything's going to go perfectly fine for us. Are we just as guilty of setting up our own idols, thinking that everything's going to be fine as long as we get our way? I think a lot of times, more often than we care to admit, we are. And we neglect to see that God is in control. So this is one of the idols that the Lord has rejected from them in verse 4. They've appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and their gold, they've made idols for themselves. Here they're finding uh, their comfort and security in their own wealth. What are they doing with their wealth? They're buying, uh, or they're use, melting their wealth together to form these idols. And there's a little bit of sarcasm here uh, in verse 6, saying, A craftsman made it. It is not God. How can you say everything has come from this when you literally just made this? It hasn't been around for however long. It's a freshly minted calf. It cannot save you. You made this. And yet the people are still going to bow down to this calf and say, Oh, Baal, you have given us everything. Please give us a little bit more. Um, and it goes on and on. The Lord says he rejects their idols. Yeah. Thank you, O tree, for providing my meal today, kind of thing. Thank you, O, <laughs> o beef, for giving me my meat today. I will hang up your tail in the living room and we will say prayers to this tail for the next month. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. And yet that's our natural tendency to go back to these things over and over and over again. How often do we do the same things? Do you not like your ruler? You take matters into your own hands. Start a hashtag, hashtag not my president, and everything's going to be fine. Or do whatever it is because you don't like your ruler. The question comes, who put that ruler there? God. God's the one who put the ruler there. What are the idols that we are clinging to? Or are we exempt from this? So I'm going to make it more personal uh, because I don't think, Dolores, you're the one who took prayer out of school and took God out of school. What are some things that we as individuals, not we collectively as a culture, we can point all day long and say, this culture is terrible. Sinners are going to sin. But we need to look at ourselves and realize, no, 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 the problem isn't them. This isn't what Israel's saying, or this is not what God's saying. Oh, Israel, you'll be fine. Assyria's going to come along. But you know me, it's okay. God is saying, you have idols in your heart, and this is the problem. So rather than looking outside and saying, the problem's outside, we need to recognize that there is a very real problem inside of us. Because if we don't recognize that, then we don't need a Savior. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Busyness. And what are you busy with? Twiddling your thumbs? <laughs> yeah, because we want to. And it, it's a good thing. Uh, finding, we could say maybe business, and there are a million reasons for why people are busy. So I'm not going to say this is the one reason. But we can look to our busyness to say, I'm valuable, I matter because I'm busy or because I'm providing something for someone else. This is where my worth is. I'm not saying this is what you say or do or why you get yourself busy, but this is a, a tendency to find our worth and our value in what we do or what we contribute to society. Where is our value to be found? Or anchored in? In Christ. In Christ who loves us and gave himself up for us. That's why people are valuable. Uh, it's not how, how busy that we are, and we neglect that at times. And we try to, maybe we can be busy for avoiding other things. Um, it's easier to be busy and dive into work than to deal, and then to deal with the poopy diaper. Say, someone else will change that poopy diaper. I don't, I've got other things, more important things to do. Uh, we can do that, but what has God called us to do? Thanks for sharing that. Anything else? Mm -hmm. It's easy for those to become idols, for those to become the most important thing. They take a lot of work. They take a lot of time. And those are good gifts that God has given to us. But again, we worship in creation rather than the creator. As much as we don't want to admit it, we all have idols. The problem isn't out there. The problem that we need to deal with first and foremost is in here. But the good news is that God in his word calls us out for these idols. He doesn't just say, oh, you just keep doing your thing, everything's going to be fine. But he calls us out for it in order to bring awareness to ourselves that, hey, this is not right, this is an idol. I'm clinging more so to this than I am to the Lord but also to find healing. We've seen in, uh, in Hosea, God has said that I would heal them, but they don't want to be healed. They want to continue on in their idols. They want to continue to worship these things that they are worshiping. I would heal them. I long to heal them, but they would not. Christ still longs to heal us from our idols and to call us back to himself. And he continues to do that through his word. And so as we lay our idols before him, as we turn from our idols and repent of these idols, uh, God says, you are forgiven. I have taken care of this too in my body on the cross for you. Go and sin no more. And be free. And be forgiven. Come, follow me. Verse 7 says this, For they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no hands. It yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. For those of you farmers, I don't know, now I'll preface this with this, I don't know much about farming, I don't know much about planting, but I have yet to see a planter that goes out there that someone pulls behind a tractor that just shoots stuff up into the air. Is that how you sow your field? How you plant your field? Benjamin, the sweet corn that you guys are selling? It's good sweet corn, by the way. Is that what you guys did? Just say, all right, we're going to plant some sweet corn in a few months. We're going to bring it in and sell it and make a fortune. Not really make a fortune, but maybe. Hopefully, it's good corn. We don't do that. It's ridiculous. You're not going to reap anything. But this is how God is describing the actions that these people are doing. You're spinning your tires, and you are accomplishing nothing. And when it's time to harvest, you're not going to have anything there to harvest. Should it yield? And if there was anything, strangers would swallow it up. Strangers would get it. Uh, it's not going to be yours here. So they're sowing the wind. They have nothing to show for it. It yields nothing. Verses 8 through 10, Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the nations, like a vessel in which no one delights. 
For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey all alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Even though they hire allies among the nations, now I will gather them up. And they will begin to diminish because of the burden of the king of princes. So here, verses 8 through 10, God is simply saying, the time has come. You're going to watch your land be taken away bit by bit as Assyria comes and takes stronghold by stronghold by stronghold away. And what are you going to have left? Verse 10, even though they hire allies among the nations, they recognize, you know what, Assyria is kind of a big deal right now, maybe, or Egypt is. Maybe if we stop paying Assyria and we start paying Egypt, Egypt will come to our aid and spare us from this harm and everything will be good to go. And God says, no. There's no amount of allies that you can hire that's going to deliver you from this. This whole idea of safety and numbers, when you're up against God, numbers mean nothing. And God says the time has come. Verses 11 through 14. Uh, Since Ephraim has multiplied altars for sin, they have become altars of sinning for him. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they are regarded as a strange thing. As for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it, but the Lord has taken no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities, but I will send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. The indictment comes against Israel. Verse 11, they have multiplied altars for sin. They are setting up more altars so that they can sin more and more. Verse 12, they regard my law as strange, a complete disregard for the laws of God. Verse 13, they're offering improper sacrifices or they're offering meaningless sacrifices. They're just going through the motions thinking, hey, we know God, everything's going to be fine. God has to bless us because we did the thing. We We do the thing, God blesses us. That's how it works kind of a thing. God says, no, that's not how it's going to work. Verse 14, you have forgotten your maker. The end of the day, this is the problem and the warning that comes to Hosea. Sound the trumpet and get this message out. We are holding to idols that cannot save us. We are deceiving ourselves. And the only thing that's going to, and the only possible result of this is reaping the wind. There is no benefit in doing it. And so before the time comes, God calls to the people, (laughs) slaps them on the wrist and says, stop it. And the reason for this is because he desires to heal Israel, that they would once again return to him, be forgiven, and be his. And through Israel, God would continue to call all men to himself. Uh, Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. As we open up your word today, Lord, and we study the words that you have for Hosea, God, we recognize that these words aren't just for Hosea, but these words are also for us. Your word is living and active, and it's able to pierce through our own stony hearts, God. We pray that you would help us to see the idols that we are clinging to and to confess those, Lord, not to continue to go back to them, but to confess them, to recognize that you are God and there is no other and to worship the the creator rather than creation. And God, we thank you for your word that it's true, that it not only calls us out for our sin, but that it also reveals to us what you are doing in order to spare us from judgment, in order to spare us from eternal destruction. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins in our place and to bring us to yourself in heaven forever. Lord, as we anticipate that day and as we trudge along in this earth doing doing the work that you have called us to, we pray that you would help us to keep our focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.